All right, looks like the Cord Cloud is working. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Content Routing Workgroup number 15. Um, thank you all for joining. I will share the notes, the location of the notes in the chat. You can access it. This is publicly available notes. Hey, Dean, welcome. Nice haircut, man. Uh, we'll, we'll jump in. Uh, so I did add one document to our stuff you should know list. Um, I added the IPNI metrics um, spec doc where we describe um, all of the metrics that we expose through our sit reps of IPNI, um, as well as future metrics that we'd like to get access to, and kind of some details about a little bit of the the hair on trying to expose some of those metrics, like um, stuff we're wrestling with internally by virtue of our architecture. Um, but some insight into what you can understand about IPNI if you look at sit reps or the bedrock metric stocks that we publish routinely. Um, that document's here, it's a Google Doc. Uh, feel free to leave comments there. I'll take ownership of uh, responding to questions you might have about them. Um, but those are freely available for people to take a look at. Um, we'll start the meeting off with our team updates. We've got a lot of stuff over on IPNI, so I'll rush through those. And then um, if the folks from uh, by Frost or IPFS would like to chime in and let us know what's going on with their um, their teams, we'd appreciate that as well. So over on the IPNI side of the house, uh, we are going through a foundation DB ingestion process um, so that um, we can fully replace the production uh, currently Pebble DB with uh, foundation DB. It's at about 65% ingestion of the entire uh, index. So uh, it's working its way through um, kind of some of the, the bigger provider data to be fully ingested right now. Uh, and that'll represent a snapshot of all the queryable data on IPNI that's been advertised to IPNI. Um, I expect based on previous iterations of us bringing up a new uh, IPNI instance, that this will probably be done by the end of the week. Um, that seems realistic compared to how long it's taken in the past. Um, but uh, once that happens, there'll be a bit of fine tuning that we do. Uh, so there's usually lots of knob turning and lever pulling after the fact, once we bring a new instance of an index up um, to kind of optimize and um, you know, clean up the read and write paths as uh, we're kind of testing it before we fully move it over to um, replacing production. But we'll be working on that over the course of the next few weeks. Um, and then um, we've got a good uh, healthy ongoing discussion right now about uh, deprecating our, our count function. Um, just to expose to all of you, the count function that we represent in our sit rep, um, because the IPNI key value store is so large, it's not something you can just simply query the entire thing and pull counts from. Um, also, the ingestion happens very, very fast. So um, we're talking uh, hundreds of records, I think, a second. But that obviously multiplies uh, very rapidly when you get into the minutes and hours range. And so counting while you're ingesting those records is also very difficult to do without damaging the performance or creating like costly operations, just because of the scale of ingestion that we do, uh, the scale of records that we onboard. And so um, our count function, it pulls data from a lot of different places because we've got multiple nodes. We have a very scalable architecture. And so in order to do that, we kind of have to count um, from these multiple places and bring that data together. And that creates a bit of um, confusion around the numbers because they end up being accurate, but imprecise. And so we end up with a little bit of overlap between these. And 
um, we're doing a lot of deep uh, philosophical thinking about how we can narrow down the range of accuracy that this count represents and possibly even maybe isolate it to kind of strata of the ingestion that happens to make it a little bit more beneficial for folks outside of our team who aren't as used to uh, kind of seeing that data. And you'll see a little bit of that discussion over on that metric stock that I shared. It's kind of an ongoing battle that we're fighting to try to make our our data a lot easier to understand for folks outside the team that aren't routinely working with it. We're also doing a bit of uh, cost optimization um, due to our ingestion activities. I think those of you that are on the um, cost optimization work group probably would have noticed we've had a pretty big uptick in uh, our AWS activity as we're going through that. Uh, so we've kind of looked at some of the redundancies that we maintain and whether or not uh, those redundancies are entirely necessary based on, you know, our um, kind of current backup that we have and the way that we're, you know, launching indexes. I think we've probably pruned some um, overly cautious stuff uh, that was there in our infra, but uh, ultimately, if you looked at this week's um, cost optimization work group, you'd see that we'd um, managed a pretty good uh, declination and um, demand from our AWS account. So we're trying to keep things uh, nominal, I would say is the best term. Um, we want to maintain, obviously, uh, the, the right amount of defensiveness with our infrastructure, but simultaneously only using what we absolutely need. And so it's kind of a constant balancing act that thankfully the folks on our team are pretty good at doing. Uh, but um, it's always an effort. So we've been working on that. And then uh, one thing I wanted to point out to y'all is uh, Mossy was kind enough to work with the Boost team to get a dashboard together that um, gives us a little bit more visibility into the uptake of Boost across the storage provider network for Filecoin, um, which is really neat. Uh, actually, it lets us kind of understand when Boost is updated, like how broadly uh, adopted that new version is. And that's really beneficial to the IPNI team because for those of you that aren't familiar with Boost uh, as an operation, it's kind of a, a package deal with Lotus that lets storage providers manage their Filecoin deals. Um, this lets us, it, it comes with a provider to the IPNI. Um, as part of that deal. And so the version of that provider um, can be unknown to us in a lot of scenarios. And so um, this is great because it gives us visibility into which version of provider is, has been adopted by uh, the majority of storage providers, um, which is awesome. And then uh, Masi also did something really neat that I wanted to call out, which is um, these uh, HayFill, which is our um, API that we, well, it's a service that we have um, that can be exposed via API, which uh, looks at snapshots of uh, Filecoin and lets you um, do some kind of queryable, um, queryable uh, actions that we've associated with a uh, an API endpoint you can look at. So. There's some new stuff you can look at via this, um, which is uh, you can look at the known uh, quantity of known storage providers. Uh, you can get the quantity of information stored uh, and list them by their uh, peer ID. Um, and there's some examples of this uh, in this link here. Uh, go take a look. There's actually quite a bit of other stuff that's been added that uh, exposes details about Boost and uh, just a lot of really neat and helpful stuff to folks that are trying to look at what's going on uh, at any given point uh, on Filecoin. That's the IPNI, I would say, a uh, week and a half to two weeks in a nutshell. There's been a lot of other stuff, but it's all very granular and uh, I would say mostly internal operational stuff that we've been wrestling with. But um, I'd like to pass the mic over to, it looks like IPFS has an update. Um, Lidl, did you wanna jump in and add some color to that one? Or if he's on, it looks like he's on mobile. 
Adeen, did you have uh, maybe uh, uh, insight? Yeah. I mean, yeah, uh, brief thing uh, is detailed there. Uh, Kubo uh, 0 0.21 shipped. Um, and I guess for, for routing, uh, the notable thing is that you know, bootstrapping is now a bootstrapping operation instead of a every time you reboot the node operation because we can save previously seen nodes for next time. Uh, which means like if you turn on if you turn on your node every so often, then uh, you you will still be able to get to the network even if say like the bootstrap nodes are are down or inaccessible for your region or you know, DNS got black holed or any of the variety of things that could possibly go wrong when you have like five nodes or so serving as bootstrap nodes. Um, might be that other groups interested in in uh, running routing networks like this have have similar needs, whether that's that's you know pub sub things like happens with Lotus or um, other people running DHT implementations or or whatnot. That's pretty cool, Adine. I didn't realize that that was coming down the pipe. That seems like a, I don't know how much work it was for you all, but it seems like a pretty like low cost, high value of return kind of solution. Yeah, it's it's one of those things that's been on the like, yeah, this should this should probably happen for 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 like a long time. Um, you know, it it has trade offs and such. Nothing nothing is perfect, but um, but is is better is I'd say like puts us at a, at a much better posture than we were beforehand. That's awesome. Um, but the, the one note is that this will, I think, impact what we had as our design for ambient discovery. And so we should think about how that, so that gets more complicated because nodes aren't all talking to a single set of bootstrappers anymore. Um, so it probably does mean that we need to uh, update that to understand what the right path forward is. Question for Adin, please. Uh, what's the uh, is there an expiry for the nodes that we've seen before, like as a bootstrap? How, how far back does it keep the nodes? Um, I don't recall offhand. I don't know, Lytle, if you know. Um, it might just keep them until you know you you turn it back on and then it and then it cycles them again if it's been a while. But mm -hmm. I I don't remember the numbers offhand. No worries, but there is some some kind of expiry, isn't it? And yeah, it's not like the first time you load, you load a bunch of nodes into your like cache, and then those are the nodes that serve as your bootstrappers forever. Uh, yeah. Those those nodes rotate every so often. Great, thank you. Thanks, Will, for calling that out. Um, we'll definitely throw an item in the in the backlog to keep an eye on how that's going to impact the design presently proposed for ambient discovery. I think regarding the topic of ambient discovery, and I won't dig us too deep into this hole, but it's one thing that I want to keep um, just kind of at the front of people's minds, just because um, we're a little bit delayed in the sense that um, we're not working towards a lot of new features this quarter on IPNI, but uh, I suspect that we will achieve a lot of those features that demand ambient discovery pretty quickly um, once we start to focus on it again. And so I think we'll we'll potentially be in a scenario where uh, we approach the need for ambient discovery much more quickly than um, we may expect. <laughs> it'll it'll sneak up on us, and I want to make sure. Uh, we're all kind of aware that it's coming down the pipe. We want to keep pushing for it. Um, Bye, Frost team. Uh, would you like to share an update with us? So I saw the the thread that you were you were 
uh, talking with George about uh, not, not metrics not not appearing. Uh, uh, this is well, I've added the, the versions that we are currently running. At least as far as our source control is concerned. So I am assuming that that is current. Uh, basically, yeah, we sh we uh, should be updating to zero twenty one over the next few days, probably at least from what I saw about George. One thing is there was this discussion that perhaps it would be good for one of the four production bootstrap nodes to not be running on Kubo and possibly even half and half. So I'm working with Max right now to, well, Max is uh, just making sure that the Rust DP2P server is actually stable so that we can actually run it in production and we will migrate the, once, once we see that, which should be this week, uh, we will migrate the New York uh, Bootstrap node to use the Rust server so that basically if there are bugs in Kubo, uh, we don't basically throw the network down, the whole network, because there are no Bootstrap nodes. That's uh, that's awesome. Th this update from Bifrost, I think, is it's very helpful to have this visibility into what what versions of Kubo are, are running on which and sharing that information. Um, the the thread that um, that uh, we just mentioned, just so uh, everybody's kind of on the same page, was a request for feedback on the versions of Kubo, which are running on the Bifrost clusters. And so there is a work effort underway that we don't really have a timeline established right now, I think, unless that's changed over the last two weeks. Let me know if I'm wrong on that Bifrost team. But um, in order to add this as um, a metric that could be viewed in a dashboard, and then um, potentially to recognize, I think, um, loss of traffic is another thing that we were looking for is like some alerting uh, around that from gateways to IPNI from outside the IPNI where our um, post-mortem takeaways. Um, the only thing I would ask the Bifrost team is if there are GitHub issues associated with those efforts. Um, please share them so that people in this group can tuck in and check on them if they're working on something relative to those or they're um, concerned about the status of them or something. That would be helpful. Yeah, there's, yeah. A, there's an issue. I'm not aware of any issues. Perhaps you are, Cameron. There's one for the, um, there's an issue already for the IPNI monitoring from the incident tracking that, which is basically waiting on 20 or 21 to get out. Um, and then we will make one for the other one and share it with you. There isn't one for it at the moment, the version tracking. Okay. Thanks. I appreciate that, guys. All right. Um, so I threw a few topics up here. Um, the first of which is kind of an ongoing discussion that has been going on that um, I think we should um, kind of wrap up like what our path of action is going to be. Um, but there's been an ongoing discussion, which was uh, HTTP records uh, Ludell brought up to the team, uh, IP IP 0388, uh, routing uh, HTTP API support for querying multiple routers. So there's a spec uh, linked to that description there that you can take a look at. Uh, when we last left off, uh, we had a meeting to discuss whether or not we were gonna do this and the magnitude of the uh, impact, uh, I think. And um, I think Monsi had proposed during that discussion that we um, kind of check out the, the magnitude of these lookups uh, to get straight to the point. Uh, I think we can look at this, but 
PNI team is very lightly resourced right now. And uh, our Q3 is completely maxed. Uh, and there are a lot of things that we, I would say aren't even nice to haves, but are need to haves that probably aren't going to make it into our Q3. And so adding even a, uh, a simple task to that stack of stuff, uh, I think we're we're pretty hesitant to to do without uh, really understanding how demanding it is um, before we change gears and try to make sure that we implement it. Uh, not saying that we shouldn't do this or that uh, it wouldn't be something that we would plan, just that um, for us to understand like when and where we would do this, is going to be a little bit difficult now because everything we've got is basically critical this quarter. And um, if this can wait till Q4, that's probably going to be um, a little bit uh, easier to approach. But if it's something that needs to really be done in uh, Q3, then I think we should understand that now and then try to wrestle with um, that urgency. I was wondering if... Liddell or Dean, if you could give us some perspective on how urgent this is and like kind of when it really does need to be done, like the component of IPNI that needs to be implemented to enable this. So I, I guess the short version is like, I would expect that the amount of stuff to be done to support this is pretty low, given that either you know, we, we could send PRs for the things that implement, you know, most of the, like any, any of the changes here, but also because things about like, oh, how much traffic are we going to serve and whatever are, are somewhat moot given that this is the status quo. So at the moment, uh, the cascade parameters, right, are, uh, if you want to ask somebody to do DHT queries for you, probably the easiest way is going to be to write like a non like like non IPIP routing v1 interface thing, but the thing that targets uh, the IPNI specific API. Um, and there's already like a library in JavaScript I wrote to do this whenever IPFS thing was because that was the only way to get the data I needed to get, uh, particularly for things like HTTP records and, and other stuff as well. So this is there, it's in use. If people are plugging it into Helia because they don't want to do DHT crawls in a browser, this is what's already happening. So like the, the status quo is gonna, is gonna keep, on, keep on doing its thing um, unless we want to make a change. Um, and so we have to like change away from the status quo if that's what we want to do. And then otherwise, this is if it's just like changing, you know, around a little bit of like, okay, don't query all the backends in a cascading way, query them based on what you know they have. Uh, my suspicion from the index star code is that this isn't very much work to say, don't do, <laughs> don't do it all of them, do just some of them. Um, do we all agree on, on the IP and team? This is something we should do, right? I think we came to the conclusion that it makes sense, right? We don't yeah, have I, think, like... I think we need some kind of standardization on the cascade business. So I think that's welcome. The only thing that uh, comes to mind is, you know, the, the current cascade in IPNI always looks up IPNI in addition to something else, right? And then the main rationale for that was to stop people from using sit.contact to only look up DHT. Right? <laughs> so that you, you, it always includes IPNI because you're calling an IPNI amp. Is, is there something in the proposal or, or, or do you think we need this type of protection in the API designs in the delegated one? Um, maybe, I, I don't know if that's such a, It seems like you could probably just rate limit them independently or something if like that's the that's the concern. 
I guess. Um, like the, I think the the main reason for allowing my my opinion to like allow for querying independent routers um as mentioned in that issue is to allow to allow you to choose which which of the delegates you're going to use for which backend which for which types of backends and which work you're willing you're willing to do yourself um and you can only do that by sort of comparing results by going to multiple delegates or doing the work yourself and saying if i ask some if i if i ask you know if I ask George to do the work, is he doing it as well as if I did it or like good enough? Uh, and if I can't ask that question, then I sort of have, I'm sort of just guessing or I'm, or I'm over asking. I'm like, you know what? Provider records, I just need to get enough of them. Ideally, they'd be the, the best records in a good sorted order, but I'm willing to settle for getting any of them. So I get my data. So let me just ask everybody I know who will, I can delegate work to. And so this allows for like narrowing that down. Um, but it's still very reasonable for anyone who's providing a delegate service to say, you know what, uh, for every, like DHT lookups are more expensive for me than IPNI lookups. And those are more, you know, and and BitTorrent lookups are more expensive than, than, than Kademlia DHT lookups or something. And so therefore the amount that I give you to each of these is, is limited. Mm -hmm. uh, next question. Uh, this feature, by the way, doesn't exist in IPNI at all. So I'm, I'm just brainstorming a little bit. Do you want to also label which result came from which router? Or is that relevant at all? To you? Um, it's a good thought. I, I, I was thinking about that. I don't think it's, we could do it. I don't know if it's strictly necessary. Um, I'm mostly thinking that like, if the point of this is to help you with probing to some extent, then you can you can separate out the probes from the other ones, um, and that way you would you you wouldn't need to necessarily know this all the time, and you wouldn't need to double count them and say how am I getting them, and you wouldn't need to deal with like duplicates where like you're sending me back the same address multiple times but tagged with I got it from IPNI really quickly, and I got it from the DHT like a little slower. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't need to send the record back twice and have the client deduplicate. So I feel like probably for now it's not worth the complexity, and if we find it is, then that could be a separate iPad. That makes sense. Thanks, Eddie. All right. I think that's... I don't know if there are separate. So I don't know if this is quite this the same thing. Maybe it's not the HTTP over this, the line about HTTP over lib P2P is fine, but uh, pure HTTP implementations is up for addressing. Is, is that specific to this IPIP or is this, a, this, is this like a separate IPNI thing? This is the discussion outside of the, I, I pulled kind of the relevant points from the previous discussions we've had. So we've like, kind of talked about it twice and I tried to kind of uh, gather what stood out to me as like important details from those discussions. I think the TLS cert thing is kind of, that's uh, errant from what we're discussing now. I'll wipe that off of here. Um, yeah, because I'm sort of curious about this as well, that from what I can tell, I, I'm not sure I understand what's supposed to be the intentional behavior. Like right now, the IPNI um, trustless gateway code is that code. Does that code implicitly have some logic that's like, if multi adder ends in slash HTTPS, then ignore the peer ID, go fetch the data. And if it ends, if it doesn't end in slash HTTPS, then do HTTP over lib P2P with some TBD defined semantics. I don't, I don't know that this evolved from the state of really like cascading DHT queries being like a desirable behavior so much as a, like, I mean, we've been talking for a while about how do we deprecate cascading and 
stop performing that that function, which this is kind of a, another direction to take, right? No, but this, I guess what I'm wondering is I'm this seems sure like if... a separate category. Like this is a separate, there, yeah, there's a separate. I, I, I agree. I think this is a separate thing. Uh, there are two separate things here. One is just API over cascading. The other one is just semantics of transport level. How do you handle TLS in the P2P world? Right? Mm -hmm. uh, going back to your question, I think pretty much if, if it has HTTPS, then just ignore the PRID and go, go fetch the thing. That's how it works. So that's, I think for a lot of things, that will be okay. Um, my, I, I guess I have I have sort of like two concerns with the current state of like the, the fact that the peer IDs are sort of like mandated and then we ignore them. Uh, one is that the lib P2P folks have a proposal for enabling, um, like authentication of the server with a peer ID. And so now you sort of won't have a way, you won't have a an explicit signal to know, do I need this or not? Because either way you have to make up a peer ID to put in the record. Um, so that that's like a little bit awkward. And the other is that is is just that, you know, for, for any protocol that isn't a lib P2P protocol, um we have to make up peer ids which seems unfortunate yep i agree i think i think largely this is just lack of specification just because it hasn't been needed not because we missed yeah. something and lip p2p right so i think there's a there's a bunch of work here for lip p2p folks to figure this out and i think they're in the best position to figure it out uh, it's in excellent hands uh as for the ip and i specific stuff it goes and reaches out but in ip and i messages that so, so, but then in the messages that are read back, there's expectations that there's peer ID and you know, there's signature that gets verify, verified. And there's a whole, I think, three different variations of it across different APIs. So it's like a, a you know, a peer ID is respected, but indirectly so, right? Uh, so going back to the main problem, I think the main issue to point out is that there is a need for lip P2P specifications on handling of HTTP over lip P2P. Uh, I think Marco is already on it. He's doing a lot of work. I've seen a lot of PR. So I, I, I would keep an eye on that to see how it evolves and how we can then retrofit it to everything else. Yeah, I, I guess it's, I think inevitably there's going to end up as like, cause I was trying, I was talking with Marco about this a little bit yesterday. I, I feel like mm -hmm. there Sort of inevitably, there's like three things. If I even if we just talk HTTP, which is there's HTTP and I don't and you don't have a peer ID. There's HTTP and you do have a peer ID, and there's HTTP over lib P2P, and you could express all of these with multi addresses. Uh, if you just had mul if you just had multi addresses, but but the assumptions that we make right now make you sort of choose two, out of three. Um. And so that might mean at some point that we want to see, we, we may want to try and pivot towards like multi addresses instead of most of a multi address plus a peer ID. Because the multi address may have a peer ID or may not. All right. So I think the, the summary there is, is that. This is important. We've got like pretty significant adoption. It's also dependent on work that the lib P2P team is doing for now. Uh, it sounds like on the IP and I side, we probably agree that this isn't like a major undertaking. So maybe our commitment from the IP and I side will be that we we try to sneak this in along, <laughs> along with uh, some of our other work where we see fits once we've checked in with the lib P2P folks to see what what they're doing on their end. Um, I mean, Torfin, we, we probably should know what the concrete decision is before we commit to implementing a, a non-concrete thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think my, my question is, is, is sort of how much effort would it be to switch from the key, from the provider values being multi-addresses 
plus peer IDs to just multi addresses? If the See, answer we is already it's have hard, the, then yeah, right. go ahead. We already have the adder. So there's nothing stopping you from having peer ID inside of that. But we also have an ID, right? I think we I, I think there is some negotiations need to happen here, which are non-technical in my opinion. They're just mostly specification because the main thing we care about is not to break people, right? Uh, and that I think should come from the P2P folks. But happy to get involved. I think uh, Marco tagged me in a in a HTTP spec thing, so we probably we should talk to HTTP people. Oh, sorry, to the P2P people to understand what the progress is there, and then see how it fits. Does that make sense? Anyway, what do you think? Yeah, I, I I think I think it's fine. Although I guess I'm. Uh, I like I'm I'm a little concerned. What worries you? Like, like, I want to know what worries here. you. I just I want things to like fall in the gap here because there's the specification of like how is it that one does the negotiation of a peer ID uh, with, over HTTP if you so choose to do to do that, and then there's like, okay, cool, but how am I going to represent all of these to put them in a provider record, um, which are sort of like which are are slightly different concerns, right? Whether whether lib P2P chooses to use for you know HTTP over lib P2P, whether they use dot well known or identify doesn't really impact this at all. It's like a separate, separate kind of problem. It, if we prefer to wait for the other thing to like land before coming back here, that's fine. I don't think we're in like a big rush. Um it's it's just like we end up with a, we're we're already in this awkward situation where we're like manufacturing a peer ID to drop it. <laughs> mm. So um I like I think we already I think we already see the problem without any of the things the Lapita P folks are doing. Gotcha. But if, if it's so, easier uh, from a timing perspective, we can wait. I guess I guess the main sticking point then as far as the IPNI specification is concerned is that ID field in advertisement is mandatory. Is that the problem? Okay, uh, I'll, I'll take that as an action item then. Uh, let's put together some sort of specification on IPNI and then we discuss it there. Does that make sense? Okay. Thanks, Marcy. Um, I'm going to jump to uh, this top of mind Steve uh, dropped in here, which was, are we planning to build the HTTP routing v1 double hashing client uh, such that it can be used in Kubo? Um, my response to that is that it's not something we would get to in Q3. Um, I think... Uh, we actually don't have a backlog item for this one specifically right now, but I'm I'm going to add one. But I don't have any any expectation that we'll be able to get to this in in Q3. I think we can uh, think about the problem a bit, but uh, I don't know that we're um, going to have the resources to approach wrestling with that. Um, I did want to. I mean, ask... I guess I guess Torfin. The other question is: Is that something that is an IPNI team action item. So maybe that's a discussion of who, who owns that because that client library was something that the stewards and the, the Kubo developers wanted to do for the non-double hashed variant. So I guess it is unclear to me that that is a thing that immediately lands on whether the IPNI team has bandwidth to do it. That was the next thing I was gonna ask, Will. <laughs> so um, that and also, are we 100% sure this is the way we want to go about it? Um, is this the only solution? I, do we need a client or is this something we can handle through other interfaces? Um, I don't know that we've thought that through. Um, but any, any, any way, <laughs> the, the problem is we won't be able to do anything for this in Q3. Um, and is everyone okay with that? Is it is it a higher priority?
Uh, I, I guess the only thing I would say there is that if if you don't do this, then I mean, it, I guess you you still get something out of the double hashing work that that you've done because I guess you're you know you've uh, you've you've made a commitment in steady.contact to say we're not going to store all the plain text records, but you're still getting all the plain text queries. Um, so I, I, that's that's that like will always thing. be a long tail of requests, though, right? So even if you have the client that supports double hashing, we will still have to support the plain texting for a while until people. Yeah, update. yeah, yeah, for for sure. Um, so I, I think that's that's mostly it in terms of like if you want to uh, get clients to not be sending you the the plain text request quite as much. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's mostly just agreeing on the the spec for for how to do this. Um, I think Will said about oh, like where is this implementation going to live or whatever. I my suspicion is that there isn't a ton of like there, there's no rocket science here, given that routing v1 already exists and it's going to be the same streaming API, the same whatever. So like, yep, probably the same thing as before. Stewards will probably put one in Boxo that does this implementation and then there'll be like the server component that lives in index star and and so on um it's it's mostly about you know do people feel like they have time and willingness to engage on the spec here for now or is this something that happens later i think uh we can say later for now uh at least from the ipni side um fitting this in would be I, I don't think we have the resources. I think we can engage on the spec and, and leave PR yeah. company, or like, which I think is what the ask is here, right? And and I think that, I guess the, the thing I'd say is I don't have a clear sense of when you expect the double hash DHT work to land, but that's that refactor in Boxo of understanding how to do double hashing in general in Boxo uh, as you have these two different implementations likely then drives what the concrete implementation is for how those get uh, why interleaved and when why double right. hashing doesn't seem like it needs to do any work you you give you give the code fragment a you give the code interface a non double hashed thing then you uh, but double when do you hash it send responses get it back this is like what dh find does internally like you, you just do but that. are you going to do it in parallel are you going to do double hash and then if you think you get it you're good and you have some delay of i don't have the results so i'm going to now go back to the non double hash non private one is that bad? So it's a config option. And so we just have it as a config thing of do you fall back or not? That seems I mean, like I think that's question. probably a function. Like right now, right? If we did this, I'd be like, okay, CID.contact is a thing that supports double hashing. Right. Therefore, if I'm just sending requests to CID.contact, just use double hashing and then fail if otherwise. And that's like that's the status quo does this anyway. So it's basically like, is there, a, is there an options? Is there some way for me to discover that, you know, this set, this IPNI instance supports double hashing? If so, use it. If not, go away. And things only become more complicated if you start saying, oh, well, I'd like to ask the same node. I'd like to ask the CID.contact node to also do DHT routing or something for me which will be a clear, a clear text. Maybe I just delay that one a little bit. Um, but for now, we don't have that one either. So it's just kind of like whichever. <laughs> so inside uh, Kubo, what you're imagining, I think just, to, just so I understand, is basically another routing system which implements delegated routing, but internally does double hashing. And then you just have multiple routers, just like we do now, which is DHD and C.contact would have C.contact double hash to something like that. Is, is that what you imagine? Yeah, to some extent. And then, you know, the order in which you query things and how long and whatever will have the same set of games as now, which is like, do I want to wait? Do I want to do the DHT and, and C.contact in parallel or do I wait? If I had multiple IP like delegated routers for CID for IPNI, would I query them all in parallel? Would I do them one at a time? You have the same set of games you do anyway. Um, it's just just now with a slightly different capability that you might choose to prioritize differently by default. Okay, so I guess there are 
three different things that I see. One is the specification for delegated routing for uh, uh, double hashed records. The other one is the implementation of the client uh, for that HTTP specification. And the other one that is in there is the DHT implementation of it. And I think we want all of those to work in harmony in that for the DHT I mean, one, the DHT doesn't uh, have to land to, I mean, like, I think the part uh -huh. of the part Part of the thing with these routing interfaces is like every system's going to be slightly different, right? We start adding support for like, you know, BitTorrent records or or mm. the things that like number zero is working on inside of Kubo. I have no guarantee that they're going to do double hashing or that they'll do it in the same way. Yep. Uh, and that's okay because like we're just trying to get some records and move on and the client has to make some educated choices around you know where they're willing to make their privacy versus latency trade-offs yep so i guess if i want to break it down i would say that the engagement on the specification absolutely we should we should be engaged i think we are we have been if, if it's been quiet apologies we'll get back to it uh, in terms of implementation is there a meta product question in that do we want to launch this without dht being ready or do we want to launch it as a wholesome privacy enabled all over the routing system. And that's that's not a technical question, you know, that's just like a product launch thing. What is the direction here? Yeah, my 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 gut is like don't wait for somebody else to do work to show off your work. Uh <laughs> that's like my my initial reaction cuz you probably don't want to wait for the double hashing stuff, but uh, in the DHT, but you know, uh, up for up for disagreement. I mean, I, I think even in this scenario, probably th this feels to me like something we would try to start hacking at potentially in Q4 if we were to, um, assuming that the implementation itself would actually live uh, with IPNI. It sounds like, I mean, we really do need to nail down like whether or not this would be uh, i think the implementation would go to boxo without a doubt for for the for the http uh delicate routing version at least uh, who does it i'm not too concerned about that i mean we will we'll figure it out but yeah i think this this feels like a q4 thing to me yeah <laughs> uh, just based on how busy we are right now but I'll uh, I'll talk to Steve about that too since he brought up this question. So I'll, I'll follow up with him. Uh, but I agree on the spec. Well, that's a good call. I don't think anything should stop us from hacking at specs. Um. Well, that kind of covered all the items. Did anybody else have anything top of mind that they wanted to uh, review while you had this group here? If not, then uh, we'll we'll cut it short for I think the first time in quite a while. Take care, everybody. Good to see you.